lot of time to go home and eat and come back. So I apologize to those of you who did come at 2.30. I did want to start a little bit later to allow more people to trickle in. On Friday evening, we, we did something that I'm not sure all of you were here, so I just want to explain again what we can do. I, I subscribe to a service where I can make this presentation a little bit more interactive. So if you, and you can log into this service and you can take part in some of the questions that I'm going to ask this afternoon. So the way you would log in, I think probably all of you have smartphones with you. So on the left side of the screen, you would uh, type the number, you're going to text to the number 22333. And in the message, you would type what it says there, Pamela Litvak 160. So the number that you type to is 22333, and the message itself would be Pamela Litvak 160. If you do that, you should get a reply back saying that you have registered for something called Poll Everyone, and you can participate in some of the polls that we'll be doing this afternoon. My subscription is kind of the lowest level, which means that I'm allowed to have 25 people respond to my questions. So if we end up having more than 25 people come this afternoon, chances are they're not going to be able to register because I'll be over the limit, but I think we'll be okay for now. So if you want to get in, you're more than welcome to at this time. Thank you for attending the afternoon sessions of my series, Weaving the Shadowlands of Stress, Depression, and Anxiety. I wanted to start with a poll question, so I don't know if you guys are... Okay, some of you have already responded. The question here is, tell us in one word something that is currently stressing you out. Apparently, some of you are here for I don't know what reason, because nothing is stressing you out. <laughs> But what you can do is you can type in any word and the word will appear like a word cloud on the screen. So if you're registered now, you can type in a word, something that's stressing you out and it will appear on the screen. Just wanted to get an idea of some of the, some of the issues that we are dealing with. And I don't think nothing <laughs> is something that we need to deal with this afternoon. Bravo to you if nothing is stressing you out. Finances, for sure, yeah. Volunteer. Work, emotional, yeah. Stress, yes, I would agree with that. Okay. So just like a word cloud, the more people that respond with a word, the, the bigger that word would appear. But it seems like we're kind of on a spectrum here where some of these things are kind of equally distributed in our audience. So emotional stress, finances, family, work, volunteer work, yeah, these are all things that I think are pressures in our lives. Last night, I gave you a definition for major depressive disorder, so today I wanted to talk about anxiety. Um, anxiety involves excessive fear and anxiety, and you have the definitions there. Fear is an emotional reaction to something in our current environment, something that we feel is stressful or threatening. And anxiety is anticipating something that's going to happen in the future that's threatening to us. Anxiety disorders are characterized when we have fear or anxiety about things that are actually not threatening. And there are different types of anxiety disorders. I won't go, th go through all of them, but some of the more common ones are things like generalized anxiety disorder, where you have some of these symptoms that you see here. You feel restless, keyed up. You feel easily tired. Your concentration is impaired, you feel irritable, you have muscle tension, and you can't sleep very well. These are all characteristics of generalized anxiety disorder. Social anxiety disorder is where we feel anxious when we're in social situations. This is probably the most common of the anxiety disorders, and we get anxious when we're in conversation or we have to go to parties or we're around a lot of people that we don't know. We also get anxious when we're doing things like eating or drinking in public and we feel like people are staring at us, or we're performing in front of others. So public speaking is a big uh, stressor for some people. Panic disorder occurs when you have panic attacks that come on you suddenly, you can't really see them coming, and sometimes they feel like we're having a heart attack because our heart starts to beat really fast, we start to sweat, we feel short of breath, we have chest pain, so we wonder if this is a heart attack, but, but sometimes it's just a panic attack. We have some of these other symptoms as well, nausea, 
feeling dizzy or lightheaded, feeling too hot or too cold, and so on. How many people in the world do you think have anxiety? You can answer uh, one of these four answers, A, B, C, or D. A would be one out of every 10 people, so that's 600 million. B would be one out of every 100, so that's 60 million people in the world that have anxiety. One out of 1,000, one out of 10,000. Okay, so most people think that it's A, and if you were here on Friday night, then you would know that the answer actually is A. So one out of every 10 people, according to a survey that was done by the World Health Organization, say that uh, one out of every 10 people around the world, and they did this survey about, uh, I think it was 50,000 citizens of something like 17 or 18 countries. So according to that survey, they said that about one out of every 10 people have some sort of anxiety disorder, and that includes all the ones that we talked about and some that we actually didn't get to talk about this afternoon. The World Health Organization thinks that that amounts to be about 600 million people altogether. How many patients with clinical anxiety do you think are getting adequately treated for their disorder? Do you think everyone is getting treated? You would answer A, about half would be B, one quarter would be C, less than 10% would be D. Okay, interesting. Most of you did get the right answer, so it's less than 10%. And of course, this varies. When the World Health Organization do these kinds of mental health surveys, they also want to see the discrepancies that can occur between richer countries in the world versus poorer countries. And what they found is that the poor countries, in five in 100 people who have anxiety disorders report getting adequate treatment. It's not much better for the rich countries because less than one in 10 receive adequate treatment. Something that I mentioned last night is that there's a lot of overlap between depression and anxiety. So chances are really high if you have one, you might end up developing the other. The overlap is about 50 to 70%. And one question that I had and that has come up in other times that I've done this seminar is, why is that? Why is there such a huge overlap between depression and anxiety? Now, one way of answering that question is to go into the brain and see what brain areas are involved in both of these disorders. So just as kind of a foundational uh, piece of information, we know now that the brain is organized into circuits. So circuits are groups of brain areas that all work together to do one specific function. We'll talk about those functions in just a minute. But each one of these circuits can have different levels of activity to them. They can have a normal level of activity, they can be too, uh, too, too little active, or they can be overactive. And we think that different mental disorders have different patterns of either underactivity or overactivity in these different circuits. So, to describe these circuits, I think it might be helpful for us to think about a scenario where we're actually using these different circuits. So the scenario that I thought of is just driving down the highway, driving to work. So one thing that we all know is while we're driving, and I do hope that you're not just doing this, but sometimes when we're driving, we are thinking about other things, right? We're sort of planning our day, or we're thinking about something that happened that morning at the breakfast table, we're thinking about a conversation or we're trying to think about something that we want to do later on that day. So all the time there's kind of this undercurrent of thought that's happening all the time. And we think that undercurrent of thought is happening in what we call the, the default mode circuit of the brain. So the focus of the default mode circuit is always inward. It's thinking about things internally rather than having our attention focused externally to other things. So this circuit is involved in thinking, planning, remembering things about ourselves or about other people in our lives. And it's used for self-reflection. So when you're driving in your car and you're planning your day, you're using your default mode. But we can have different abnormal levels of activity in these brain circuits. And if this circuit is overactive, then it can lead to emotional and mental isolation, where we're kind of isolating ourselves inward 
and our focus is not outwardly uh, as much as it should be. Some people get into a loop of internal thoughts called rumination. And rumination can be good. You can be ruminating on positive things, but what happens with depression and anxiety is we ruminate on negative things, and we can't seem to break ourselves out of this loop. There's another circuit called salience. So we're driving along in our car, and we're you know, paying attention to the road, of course, but, and we're also thinking about other things, and then all of a sudden, a car veers into our lane right in front of us. So the circuit that's going to make us pay attention to that is called the salience circuit. Our, what our brain has to do all the time is it's being bombarded with lots of information that's coming at us from all different directions about light and temperature and air quality and what's going on in our environment. And our brain has to filter all that information and help us pay attention to what is most important and relevant to us. And that's what the salient circuit does. So it detects salient or important changes that are occurring either in our outer circumstances or sometimes inward, like we're feeling pain of some sort. And it, it alerts the rest of the brain to those changes and it tells the brain to take action on it. So as the car is veering into our lane right ahead of us, the salient circuit says, pay attention to that, that's important. It stands to reason if you have overactivation of the salient circuit, we're gonna have difficulty in determining what's important to pay attention to and what's not. So, th so this is called apprehension. We start thinking that other things or more things than we should are important and we need to pay attention to them. The next thing that happens is once, when we're driving in our car, the car veers right in front of us, we realize that that is a cause for concern, right? That's a potentially dangerous thing because we could get into an accident. So the salient circuit is going to immediately turn on another circuit in the brain called the threat circuit. So this evaluates potential threats, decides what action should be taken, both in the physiological sense, so it's gonna turn on the stress response, obviously. So you're sitting in your car, holding onto the steering wheel, and all of a sudden you feel your heart start to race. That's the stress response kicking in because the threat circuit has told it to. And then there are behavioral changes. So we may need to change how we're steering or we may push our foot on the brake or whatever we need to do. This is also the gateway to our conscious perception of threat. So what's interesting about the threat circuit is it's completely subconscious. We don't have to know that it's there for it to turn on the stress response, for example. It will do that automatically without us telling it to, but it will actually work with areas of the consciousness in the cerebral cortex to tell us what's going on and to make us feel, feel fear as a result. It stands to reason that if you have overactivation of the threat circuit, this is gonna cause us to be overreacted to threats in our environment. And we also might not have the same sort of emotional control over those threats that we want to. So this is called threat dysregulation. So I hope you're seeing that some of these patterns of abnormal activity can lead to some of the um, symptoms that we saw in either depression or anxiety. Threat dysregulation is definitely a symptom of anxiety disorders, and it also appears sometimes in major depressive disorder. So what's gonna happen then when we're driving on the road, we, there, a car veers right in front of us, the rest of the drive to work, we're probably gonna be paying more attention than we would have otherwise, right? I mean, you're constantly aware of your environment at that point so that it doesn't happen to you again. And the, the circuit that's involved in helping us pay attention to things is called the attention circuit. So this is kind of the flip side of the default mode circuit that was inwardly focused. The attention circuit has an outward focus. So it makes us more alert and it helps us to pay sustained attention to things, which is known as vigilance. It stands to reason that if this circuit is underactive, not active enough, then we're gonna have poor concentration or a severe case of brain fog. This isn't something that happens usually a lot in anxiety disorders, but it happens in depression. All right, so we're driving in our car and we've gotten stressed out because of what the car did. So we decide, you know, I deserve a treat since I didn't get into an accident. So we decide to stop by an ice cream store on the way to work. 
And the, the circuit that's involved in that is the reward circuit. It, this is the circuit that makes us sensitive to and try to seek out and anticipate rewards in our environment. It would stand to reason that if this circuit is underactivated, it's going to kind of take the shine off of things that we normally take pleasure in, whether it's relationships or hobbies that we usually do or work projects that we're usually really interested in doing. If, this, if the reward circuit is underactivated, we're just not going to be interested in those things as much. This leads to a symptom that's very common in depressive disorders known as anhedonia. The final circuit is called the cognitive control circuit. This is the executive circuit because it evaluates incoming information and it weighs the costs and the benefits of different responses and then it kind of has the power to make the executive decision of what's going to happen. Last night we talked about the prefrontal cortex. There are portions of the prefrontal cortex that are actually involved in a lot of these circuits, but this definitely has a lot of prefrontal cortex um, activation in it. So it stands to reason in this circuit that if it's underactivated, we wouldn't have as much control over the rest of the circuits as we would want to. And this leads to a symptom called cognitive dysregulation. So the way I think about the brain is I think about it like a really well-run company where you have executive leadership up at the top. And the reason why it's executive is because it has in incoming information from a lot of the departments underneath it. And it, it can use all of that information to make wise decisions about what's going to happen in the company. There are a lot of departments that work under executive leadership, and those different departments are allowed to work independently from each other, but not in isolation from each other. Those departments need to know what's going on in the other departments in order for the company to be run most effectively. So in the brain, we have different brain regions that act as hubs that are going to overlap from circuit to circuit. So you can have a, a brain signal that travels through one circuit, and it hits one of these hubs, and then it can jump over into another circuit and tell that circuit what's going on. So this is the way the brain works. Different brain circuits can work independently, but not in isolation from each other. Everybody knows what's going on. It can all work together. But if you have underactivation and overactivation of these circuits, then there becomes a disconnect, an imbalance of both communication and power between these circuits. And it becomes the, the trickiest thing is when it happens in the cognitive control circuit, because then you kind of lose control over everything. So in general terms, and I'm, I'm making this very general, is we have too much activity in, in disorders like depression and clinical anxiety. What we have here is too much activity in some of the limbic areas, some of the feeling areas of the brain, and we have too little activity in the prefrontal cortex areas, too little activity in the thinking areas of the brain. So the reason why I want to talk, talk about this is to make three points at this point regarding depression and anxiety. The first point, which I hope would be obvious, but some people need to hear it, is these disorders are real. In, the, in terms of us being able to put people into brain scanners and actually see and quantify that there are different levels and abnormal act levels of activity going on in these different brain circuits. The second point that I want to make is that Depression and anxiety share many of the same patterns of these abnormal activities in these different brain circuits. And this, to a large de degree, explains why there's so much overlap. The same circuits are involved in both uh, disorders. The third point is that the best treatments are going to um, target overall brain health. Because if you're promoting overall brain health through simple things like exercising and eating right and drinking enough water and making sure you get omega-3s and you're getting enough light, getting enough rest, all of these things are going to improve how each one of these circuits can work independently and work all together to make brain function the best it can be. But the other ways that the other treatments for these mental disorders are to try to repair the damage that, that has occurred in one or more of these circuits and also to try to repair the brain imbalance. I call these hardware and software issues because I'm comparing the brain here to a computer. Hardware issues would be 
mechanical things that are going wrong in the brain. Maybe some communication lines between these different circuits are not working the way they're supposed to. Or maybe we have too little brain chemicals in, in certain areas of the brain. And those hardware issues can be resolved if we use antidepressant drugs because that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to increase levels of brain chemicals and also repair communication lines. So antidepressant drugs are great because they do address these hardware issues that we have in the brain. But the other thing that we can use, of course, is psychotherapy because this repairs what I call software issues. Software issues would be in, uh, inappropriate or uh, improper thinking patterns that we use that actually cause us to experience more stress, more emotional stress than we should. So for the rest of the presentation, and I really had to decide what I was going to focus on because I have information on both sides and how we could Im uh, also improve brain health, but what I decided to focus on this afternoon was this final thing of trying to repair software issues. So we're going to focus on some psychotherapeutic techniques this afternoon. One of the, and there are many forms of therapy that can be used for mental illness, but one very common one for depression and anxiety is called, is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And we know that if you put people into brain scanners that are dealing with either clinical depression, clinical anxiety, you put them into a scanner before they start cognitive behavioral therapy, and then you put them in you know, a few sessions later after they've started, the brain changes. So these circuits start to work they start to play together in nicer ways, I guess you would say. And the brain, and so we have a greater balance that occurs between the emotional centers of the brain and the decision-making centers of the brain. So we do know that CBT does change the way the brain works, and so it's an effective form of therapy. Last night, I said that according to one survey that was done, one out of every five adults around the world suffers from some sort of depressive disorder or anxiety disorder. And we know based on work that's been done um, by different researchers that kind of collect all of the information that's been done on all different types of depression and anxiety disorders, that CBT is very effective for a lot of them. So it's effective for things like major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, PTSD, OCD, phobias, and so on. All right, so a very, very brief tutorial on cognitive behavioral therapy. Often what we think is that when we have an adverse event, like we get a bad grade in school or we make a mistake, we often think that that is going to directly lead to a consequence, an emotional con consequence, like feeling upset or feeling embarrassed or feeling disappointed. But actually, there's something in between these two things. An unex uh, a, a expectation about those things that wasn't realized. So in between these two things is some sort of belief about that thing that didn't actually materialize. So what could be those beliefs? Well, if we get a bad grade, we make a mistake, maybe the belief that we're filtering that event through is something like, I have to always do well or I'm a failure if I make a mistake, or this is a tragedy. And it's actually those beliefs, not the event itself, that causes the emotional response, feeling upset, feeling embarrassed, feeling disappointed, and so on. This is a very uh, pervasive concept in psychology now. This is a quote from a medical textbook by William Lavallo, and in this textbook he says, we may find that a major personal disappointment, say failing to, to get into grad school, causes great emotional distress. Or the footsteps, the sound of footsteps on a dark street may provoke a feeling of terror. The disappointment may evoke physical sensations of sadness, lethargy, or even tears of grief. The footsteps may result in fear along with a racing heart and rapid breathing. The key point to these two examples is that, is that the individual's physiological responses started out as thoughts and interpretations, mental events that are not in fact physically threatening and which in a real sense are not things at all. The emotions and physiological responses arose because of his or her interpretation of the event and it perceived meaning. So the way we interpret things has a large bearing on how we emotionally react to it. If you have footsteps following you in a dark alleyway, you might be very fearful of that, but if it turns out that that person is a friend 
someone that can protect you, then automatically your emotional response changes from fear to relief. So our beliefs are very, very strong in affecting the emotional response. In disorders like clinical depression, clinical anxiety, distorted emotions are often generated by distortions in our beliefs. And here are some examples of distorted beliefs. I must always do well. That's a cognitive distortion because it's not actually possible for us to always do well. I'm a failure. Well, if you're a failure, then so is every, everyone else on the planet because we've, always, we've all failed at something. So since we're all in the same club, I guess it doesn't really matter that we're all failures. This is a tragedy. That's something called catastrophizing because it's not really a tragedy in that sense of the word, word that we get a bad grade or we make a mistake. So the target of cognitive behavioral therapy is these distorted beliefs. We want to change this, these beliefs in order to change the resulting emotional reaction. So I'm gonna very qu quickly go through 10 uh, main cognitive distortions. There are actually a lot more than 10, but these are 10 of the most common ones. The first one is all or nothing thinking. So we get a bad, well, we get a B on a test and we actually think that that's bad because we think in terms of black or white, you know, all or nothing. And so we think that if we get anything less than an A or perfection, that we've failed. Overgeneralization is the second distortion where we take one bad event and we generalize that to mean that it's always going to happen. It always happens to us. So we get a flat tire on the way to work and we say, of course, this kind of stuff always happens to me, right? Bad stuff always happens to me. Negative mental filter is when we can't see positives in any situation that we're in. So we say, there's nothing good that ever happens to me. There's nothing good about my life. There's nothing good about my marriage. And we kind of refuse to see that there are some positives. Fortune telling is a form of jumping to a conclusion where we think that we know what's gonna happen in the future when actually we probably don't know all the time what's gonna happen in the future. So we say, I'm never gonna get over my depression. That's fortune telling because we actually don't know that that's what's gonna happen. Or we say, I know that this is gonna turn out badly. I know that I'm gonna make a mistake. And what happens with fortune telling is those become self-fulfilling prophecies. Mind reading is another form of jumping to conclusions. Here we think that we're so smart that we can tell what someone else is thinking without asking them. So we notice that a friend of ours isn't talking to us and we automatically assume then that we know that that person is mad at us. That's mind reading. Magnification and minimization. Magnification is when we magnify faults or mistakes that either we're making or someone else is making. So catastrophizing is a form of magnification because we're making something more tragic than it really needs to be. Minimizing is when we minimize our own qualities, the, the things that we're successful at. We say, oh, that was nothing, doesn't really matter. Personalization is when we take on more full responsibility for something bad that happens than we're actually re responsible for. So for example, our child is not doing well in school and we say, well, it's all my fault. Not really considering the fact that part of that responsibility is the child's. Labeling is when we use just one characteristic to characterize either ourselves or someone else. So we say, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, he's a jerk. And what we're doing there is we're just using one characteristic, not really realizing that we're all three-dimensional, multi-dimensional people with lots of different characteristics to us. So by just choosing one characteristic, and usually a negative one, right, we're probably characterizing them in a way that isn't really appropriate. And so oftentimes this isn't just labeling, it's mislabeling. Discounting the positive is the last cognitive distortion that I'll talk about this afternoon. And this is just, it's sort of like negative mental filter. You can see the positive, but you immediately discount it. So a common uh, speech pattern or thought pattern for someone who has this distortion is saying yes, but. So you say, 
yeah, she was being nice to me, but she just felt sorry for me. So you use, you find some sort of excuse to discount whatever positive thing someone is trying to tell you. So um, there was a psychotherapist early on in the 60s or 70s that developed a way to try to dispute these distorted beliefs that we have. And he called it the ABCDE technique. And what we basically do is once we figure out that we have a distorted belief, we try to disp dispute the distortion and that will lead to a new emotional response. So here we get a bad grade. We think we have filtered that event through our belief that we have to always do well and that leads to the initial emotional consequence of feeling embarrassed or frustrated. And what we do then is we dis dispute the distortion and we say, well, it would be nice if I always did well, but everyone makes mistakes. That's a realistic thought, right? And since we realize that everyone makes mistakes, the new emotional response is going to be relief. We're going to feel motivated to do better in the future. So the way I think about distorted beliefs is I think about these in terms of stress. And I think that these are usually stress-inducing beliefs because usually they're going to uh, have a stressful emotional response. Stress-inducing beliefs. We want to learn stress-reducing beliefs. So that's what we're going to do for the rest of our sessions. We're going to talk about the 10 most powerful stress-reducing beliefs. So when I first started doing this work, when I was doing my research and then I told you my stepdad actually, he's an Adventist pastor and he was involved in developing stress management seminars, we realized that forming stress-reducing beliefs is one of the most powerful things that you can do in stress management. I showed you this pyramid last night. Um, this has all of the components in it for a good stress management program. The ones on the bottom are pretty foundational things like getting enough rest, getting exercise, eating right, managing your time well. But the real power in the stress management pyramid is up at the top. So we form a more positive mental picture of what's going on. Um, we form supportive relationships with each other to help us through it. And we have a belief that there is a God, a personal and loving God who cares about us. So this afternoon, we are actually going to deal a lot with the, the top three components. The, the most powerful stress-reducing beliefs that we know of actually combine each one of them, these three components. So you'll see that each one of them is kind of a mini power pyramid. The way I think about these stress-reducing beliefs is they're kind of like a cliff with waves crashing on it, but those cliffs, that cliff is able to absorb that pounding all the time. So let's go through them. Um, what time is it? Can you still hear me? Okay, good. All right. So I'll probably get through maybe a third of these in this first session, and then we'll talk about the last, um, last of them in the, in the next session this afternoon. So the first stress absorber, the first stress reducing belief that we're going to talk about is accepting God as a spiritual parent that loves me. And this love is going to be the basis for the value that I place in myself and others. It's also going to be the release point for all my fears, anxieties, and worries. So what would our emotional reaction be if we filtered everything that happened to us through this specific belief? I have a spiritual parent who loves me. I can trust him with my fears, anxieties, and worries. So let's talk about the different aspects of this belief. One would be a basis of self-esteem. Where do we usually get our self-esteem? Usually we get our self-esteem from relationships. Women are especially prone to doing this. We kind of characterize ourselves as in terms of the relationships we have, either with romantic partners or friends or being a parent of some sort. So relationships can be a basis of self-esteem and so can possessions that we have or our wealth. So recently I was listening to a podcast. I don't know how many of you listen to podcasts, but I'm kind of a podcast nerd, I guess. And I listened to one called Freakonomics Radio. There was a, 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 a podcast episode where the host was 
interviewing a attorney from Washington, D.C. His name is Kenneth Feinberg, and he has been responsible for the financial settlements that have occurred out of a lot of the major uh, tragedies that have occurred in the past 15 to 20 years. So he was uh, um, involved in the financial settlement after 9-11. He was also involved in the financial settlement after the Pulse nightclub shootings in Orlando, Florida, what happened in Las Vegas a couple summers ago, Sandy Hook, Connecticut. He was involved in all of those. He was also involved in the financial settlement that occurred after the financial crisis of 2008-2009. So if you remember what happened then, some of the financial institutions in New York City got a federal bailout. The US Treasury gave them some money and they were supposed to pay it back with interest. Until they did that, the US Treasury decided that they were going to fix executive pay until they were paid in full. So Kenneth Feinberg was responsible for fixing compensation packages for the executives of these companies. You can imagine how well that went down. Not very well. Um, but it, this settlement hit these executives in a place that Kenneth Feinberg actually didn't expect. So when the host of this podcast was interviewing Feinberg, he said, well, what kind of pushback did you get from these executives when you told them they were, you were going to fix their pay? And Feinberg responded, he said, well, what I thought was going to happen is that these executives were going to moan about how they couldn't afford their yachts or sending their kids to private school or maybe they were going to have to sell one of their houses. But that's actually not what they came back and, and complained about. What they complained about was how this was hitting their image of themselves, their self-worth. So Feinberg uh, phrased it as he thought that these executives were using their wealth as the sole barometer of their worth. And when that was taken away from them, then their self-worth, of course, went down. Now, I'm not saying that capitalism is bad. That's not really the point that I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to say is, as you go up the ladder of success, oftentimes our self-worth is also going to climb. But when you go back down for whatever reason, then our self-worth might also go down. So possessions and our sense of success or failure in life could also be changeable bases for self-esteem or self-worth. There's only one unchangeable basis of self-worth, and it's in the Bible. So all of you know this verse, so I want you to say it with me. For God so loved the world, gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we know that we are all of infinite value. And how do we know that? We know because we were bought with an infinite price. That is the worth that all human beings share. And there's nothing that we can do to add to that. There's nothing that we can do to subtract from it. Nothing we can do can alter our, our value in God's heart. So it's not really something that we need to worry about. Our value, our worth is actually in God's hands. This can be a release point for worry that we have. So 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I wanted to tell you the rest of the story of what I talked about this morning, the rest of our 9-11 experience, Oleg is, Oleg's and mine. So in the months that followed 9-11, um, we did wonder if we wanted to stay in New York, New York City because we actually were worried about raising our daughter in an environment where we had to worry about terrorism along with being in a major city. But we came to the point where we needed to be okay with being there if that's where God wanted us to be. So I remember talking to my mom on the phone. We had many phone conversations in those months, and she was asking me, so what are you guys planning to do? Are you going to leave the city? What's happening? And Oleg and I were telling our family members who were concerned about us, really what we need to do is we need to be where God wants us to be. And if he wants us to stay here where there is suffering, then that's what we need to be willing to do. We were sitting at our kitchen table and this was, I don't know, a few months after 9-11, a few, few months. 
And we actually sat down with the express purpose of praying that prayer. We said, God, whatever you want us to do, we're willing to do. If that means staying here, we're going to stay here. But if you have some other plan for us, then please show it to us. This is not an exaggeration. It was not even five minutes after we finished praying that prayer that I got a phone call from someone that I did not know at Loma Linda University asking me to come out and interview for a job there. I still don't know to this day actually how this person got my name and contact information. I have suspicions, but I don't exactly know how it happened. It must have been a God thing. So they said, so are you willing to come out and, and interview? And before they even finished the sentence, I said, yes. <laughs> and that's how we ended up moving from New York to Loma Linda. That was my first job there. But we had to be willing to stay in New York if that's what God wanted us to do. There's a concept in stress management called transcendent stress, which is the kind of stress that we willingly seek in order to serve a higher purpose. So transcendent stress, a good example of that, of course, is what Jesus did for us on the cross. It was suffering that he willingly went through in order to save us. And sometimes what we found as believers is God invites us to be part of the transcendent stress process. So we are supposed to go into the parts of the world where there is suffering, there is terrorism, there is war, there is pain and disease. We are supposed to participate in that in order to relieve the suffering where we can. I think this is what um, Jesus was talking about when he said, I've told you this so that trusting me you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart, I've conquered the world. This is a prayer that I found in the same book that I quoted from this morning. It was just so beautiful, I wanted to share it with you this afternoon. My God, I wish to give you the gift you so much desire. I wish to commit myself to you once and for all, so that there shall be no taking back. I cannot commit myself into your hands, O oh God, I cannot do it. But yet I can commit myself into your hands, for though I cannot keep myself there, your fingers can hold me there. Your strong, gentle fingers always giving way and never letting go. Your wise, subtle fingers wrestling so gently against my puny rebellions, so that I tire myself trying to climb out of your hands and come to rest at last in those wounded palms. The second powerful stress-reducing belief that I'd like to share with you is living our day one day at a time. Effective stress managers live in day-tight compartments. They don't worry about yesterday. They don't worry about tomorrow. They worry about what's going on today. And this is something else that helped Oleg and I go through our 9-11 experience. There were often times where we didn't know what was going to happen in the future. And so on those days, we just tried to, I tried to be the best mother I could be, the best wife I could be. So you focus on the tasks before you in that one day. You live one day at a time. What would our emotional reaction be if we filtered everything that happened to us through this Bible verse? Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's another story, a Corey Ten Boom story, um, that I'd like to share with you. If any of you have read this, read her book, you probably know it already. But Corey and her family lived in a city called Harlem in the Netherlands. Um, she grew up in the years before World War II. And every once in a while, her father would take her on the train between Harlem and Amsterdam so that he could check his timepiece. He was a watchmaker, so he could check his timepiece against a big clock that was in that main city. There was one year where a uh, illness kind of went through Harlem and wiped out a lot of the population, especially children. So Corey's family was heavily involved in trying to relieve suffering in that city. And so they had just, on that day, been to a home where a baby had died. And Corey had seen this. It was the first time that she, she had actually seen a baby die. And the, the experience really haunted her. So she came home that night. It was the first time that she realized that people that she knew and, could, and cared about could actually be gone someday. 
So when her father came to tuck her into bed that night and um, pray with her, she burst into tears and she said, please don't leave me. I don't want you to ever leave me. And her father had to think about how he was going to respond to that. Corey, he asked gently, when we take the train to Amsterdam, when do I give you your ticket? Well, just before we get on the train. Exactly. And our wise father in heaven knows when we need things to. Don't run ahead of him, Corey. When the time comes for one of us to die, look into your heart. You will find there the strength you need just in time. There's a very cool poem by Helen Mailcoat that I thought was appropriate for this particular stress-reducing belief. It's called I Am. I Am, of course, is one name for God in the Bible. I was regretting the past and fearing the future. Suddenly, my Lord was speaking. My name is I Am. He paused. I waited. He continued. When you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, it's hard. I am not there. My name is not I was. When you live in the future with its problems and fears, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I will be. When you live in this moment, it is not hard. I am here. My name is I am. Lord, you will give perfect peace to those who commit themselves to be faithful to you. That's because they trust in you. The third stress-reducing belief is living by the serenity prayer. If you probably have heard this prayer before. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The first time that we saw this prayer start appear um, in the general public was during World War II. Chaplains started carrying this, this prayer around with them. It was written by a theologian named Reinhold Niebuhr. This prayer has been used by many stretch, stress management experts. My stepdad, who's an Adventist pastor, used this a lot in his counseling with individuals. So there is one story that he used to tell where he was dealing with a man who was really on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He called my stepdad and he said, I can't take this anymore. If I don't get help with my stress, I, I'm going to die. That's what he said. And so Skip met with this man, and what he had the man do was make a list. Those of you who were at Jennifer Jill Schwarzer's uh, seminar, she had something similar where she did a T-chart. You remember us doing that together? where you have a list, you do pros of a decision and, pro and cons on the other side. Well, my stepdad did the same thing, only this was based on the serenity prayer. And what you do is you take a list, you, you write down a list of a situation that's um, causing you stress. And you write down on one side the things about that situation that you actually have control over. And you write on the other side the things that you don't have control over. So my stepdad went through this exercise with this man. What he realized is that the man does something that we often, all of us do, which is sometimes we write things on the list of things that we control. He actually had some things on that side that we, he actually did not have control over. So he encouraged the man to move those things over to the things that he didn't have control over. And what Skip told him, my stepdad told him, is that those things on the side of the list that he didn't have any control over, those were things that God did have control over. And he could decide in his own time to change those things anytime he wanted to. And there was really no reason for the man to take on the burden of those things because they were in God's hands anyway. So Skip had him focus on the parts of the problem that he actually did have control over, that he, he could actually change. And he asked him to look at that list and kind of prioritize them. Look at the list and see what are the things that you think would make the greatest impact on the problem and focus on those first. So this is a simple exercise that we can do to implement the serenity prayer in our lives. I recently read the story of a man named Gary Mendel. He, he and his wife um, wrote a, an article for USA Today sometime last year and what they were writing about was the death of their son, Brian. Brian was 25 years old when he died. He had struggled with drug addiction for many, many years. He had been through eight different 
rehab programs. And he had been clean for a year when he died, but he, he died of an overdose. So Brian and, or um, I'm sorry, Gary and his wife were dealing with their son's death. And what got them through it, he said in this USA Today article, was the serenity prayer. He meditated on the first part, God grant me the serenity to, to accept the things I cannot change. There was nothing they can do for their son Brian anymore. They knew that he had been dealing with a dreadful addiction, but that his battle was basically over with it. But they wanted to find the courage to change the things that they could. So when they looked at the second part of the serenity prayer, what they decided they could do, the meaning that they could bring out of Brian's death was to start a nonprofit organization to help other families who were, suffer who were dealing with family members with addiction. So that's what they did. That's how they implemented the serenity prayer into this tragedy in their life. So what would our emotional response be if we filtered everything that happened to us through the serenity prayer? In Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, he wrote, he wrote, when you think about a problem over and over again in your mind, that's called worry. When you think about God's word over and over in your mind, that's called meditation. If you know how to worry, you already know how to meditate. You just need to switch your attention from your problems to Bible verses. The more you meditate on God's word, the less you will have to worry about. The fourth stress-reducing belief is accepting personal responsibility for our happiness. So to a large extent, we ourselves control our emotional responses to things. What would our emotional reaction be if we believed this? We, if we believed that we control our own beliefs, our opinions, our desires, and even our happiness? There's a concept called locus of control. So when therapists are working with patients, they try to get the patients to explain who or what they think is in control of what's happening to them. And patients can think that those things are external to them, like fate or circumstances or somebody else. You know, it was all my parents' fault or my brother's fault or whatever. And there are other people who take internal control of what's happening to them. So they feel like they have emotional and cognitive control over what's going on. And generally, the people who have internal control are the people who make more progress in therapy. Dear, uh, Dr. Harold Greenwald was a therapist who was working with patients for over 30 years when he came across a problem he had never seen before. He had a patient come to him, and this patient, well, he asked the patient, he said, so how can I help you? And the patient said, well, I actually think I'm a pretty happy person. There's nothing really, anything wrong with me. I just thought that maybe since you're a, an expert or you're a professional in this field, you could teach me how to be even happier. And that was a problem that this therapist had never heard before. He had never had someone come to him and ask him to teach them how to be happier. He was an expert in misery. He knew how to deal with problems of misery, but he had no idea how to teach people how to be happier. So he decided that he wanted to change this. He became a happiness expert or a happiness researcher. And he wrote a book about this called The Happy Person. He said in the book, my most surprising discovery was how many of the joyous, satisfied people I interviewed for this book had undergone traumas, frustrations, and defeats remarkably similar to my misery-laden patients. The happy people I interviewed in preparing this book had all chosen not to be victims. They had chosen to be happy. Most often, the decision was made on the heels of a severe emotional or physical crisis in their lives, a near-fatal accident, disastrous divorce, and so on. Now, these, clearly, these are clearly the circumstances many sad people use to explain their own unhappiness. So why weren't these people sad? Again and again, I found that they made use of such circumstances to re-examine their way of looking at the world. They then decided consciously or unconsciously they were responsible for their own happiness. Happiness is a choice that we can all make. We all, to a large extent, are in control of that. What would be our emotional response if we actually believed this? 
Abraham Lincoln said, people are as happy as they make up their minds to be. So I was interested in this concept of happiness. This come, so what I'm going to tell you now is from a research article that was published not too long ago, I think in 2018, maybe, maybe 2019, I can't read it. I have all of my research citations up there in case you're interested. But what we think now in the happiness literature world is that there are three components to happiness. And here I'm using terminology that I found in a book on resilience that was published in 2017 by a guy named Eric Greitens. He calls them the happiness of pleasure, the happiness of grace, and the happiness of excellence. So happiness of pleasure, of course, are the things that bring us pleasure in our lives, things that bring us happiness. So what things do you enjoy doing? Just call them out to me. What things do you really love? You love spending time with family. What else do you enjoy doing? Hiking. Hiking? Sure. What else? Sorry? Singing. Happiness of pleasure, singing, for sure. Listening to music is also, yes? Gardening, okay, awesome. So, say again? Never heard of it. Swiss ball dancing? Yeah, come on up here and do it. <laughs> Swiss, <laughs> Swiss ball dancing. You have to, is there a YouTube video available on that? I have to see that. Oh, yeah, do it, do it. Sure, so all of these hobbies and things that we enjoy, eating and spending time with people, these, are, these bring us pleasure, right? And this is a component of happiness. But there are actually two other components. One other component is the happiness of grace. And I'm not us necessarily using grace in the spiritual or religious sense of the word here. It's not really the unmerited favor that we get from God or forgiveness. What I'm talking about here is the appreciation that we get out of the things that we do or have in life. So the happiness of grace is what you experience when you express gratitude, when you say thank you for something. That's the happiness of grace. The third is what we call the happiness of excellence. And this is when, like this morning, I was talking about the suffering that we seek. We seek suffering or we go through suffering when we're trying to reach goals in our life. This is the happiness of excellence, excellence when we're training for something, we're exercising, um, we're eating well, we're trying to work hard to get a job promotion or studying for a degree. All of these things bring us happiness because we're accomplishing an important goal to ourselves, right? So all three of these are components of happiness. There are a couple of takeaway uh, messages that I get from this. Number one, all three are components of happiness. So when we think about happiness, it really does include all three of these. But the other takeaway that I get from this is one very large component isn't going to make up for a lack of another component. So often people just focus on pleasure. Some people just want to have pleasure and other people say, oh no, ple all pleasure is bad. They're both wrong because pleasure is a component of happiness. It's just not the whole package, right? We also need to have happiness of grace and happiness of excellence. What we found in the, the recent research literature is all three components are linked to greater stability, greater satisfaction in our family, greater satisfaction in our relationships. We perform better in our jobs. There's better disease resistance. We have better physical and emotional health. And we even have longer lifespans if we have all three of these components of happiness. So there was one study that was done, and it was done on a one and a quarter million people. So oftentimes what researchers will do is they will take a lot of different studies that have been done, and they'll compile them and do statistical analysis on all of the studies put together, and it's called a meta-analysis. So these researchers did a meta-analysis on about 60-some studies, and the participants were in, like I said, uh, one and a quarter million people. And they were comparing two groups of people, one group of people who had these components of happiness and the other group that did not. And what they found is that the happy people outlived the unhappy people by almost 10%. Which may not sound like a lot, but that could be six or seven or eight or nine years. And I'll take that. That's okay with me. 
So oftentimes when, when we do these kinds of studies, people will make the argument that happiness isn't really in and of itself a healthy thing. Maybe it just promotes healthy behaviors. And yeah, they did find in this study that the happy people exercised more and they ate more fruits and vegetables and they smoked less and they drank less. They used more sunscreen and they got more physical exams. So yes, they did all of these things. And I guess I would make the argument that if happiness does promote health promoting behaviors, that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, if that's the way we increase our lifespan, so be it. I'll take that, that's okay. But they also did find that there were some other more physiological changes that happened with these components of happiness. They had less stress hormones circulating in their bodies, one being cortisol. They had less inflammation to worry about. They had better heart health. They had a better cholesterol profile, and they had less wear and tear on their entire bodies due to stress. Stephen Covey, who wrote a book way back when, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he put it in these terms. He said that this is the good weather factor. People who take personal responsibility for their emotions, behavior, and success create their own internal good weather and carry it with them wherever they go. So they decide themselves that they're going to be happy in life. And they take that with them in any circumstances that, that they find themselves in. The, where, where are we on time? Should I stop or, let, let me do one more. Or at least I'll start this one. Say again, what time is it? Okay, okay. So the, the fifth stress reducing belief is choosing to cultivate the attitude of gratitude every day and in every circumstance of life. So this is the happiness of grace, right? Is this stress reducing belief. What would our emotional reaction be if we filtered everything that happened to us through the belief that there's always something to be grateful for, always much to be grateful for? Hen Salier was kind of the father of stress research. The concept of stress is, well, it's gonna sound old to you, but it's actually relatively young in the research world. It's only been around for about 100 years or so. And this guy was the guy who started all of it, Hans Selye, him and another guy called Walter Cannon. But in um, Hans Selye's um, words, he thinks that gratitude is actually one of the most powerful things, the choices that we can make to improve our stress management skills. He wrote, I think in the final analysis that gratitude and revenge are the most important factors governing our actions in everyday life. Upon them also chiefly depend our peace of mind, our feelings of security or insecurity, or fulfillment or frustration, in short, the extent to which we can make a success of life. Many people make gratitude a choice, just like happiness is a choice, Gratitude, the happiness of grace, is also a choice that we can make. And we find this concept actually in the Bible, in different experiences that, character, that people have had. There's this story in the book of Acts. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After that, they were severely flogged, or after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. We all know that flogging back in those days was no joke, right? They took strips of leather, embedded pieces of metal in the ends, and flogged them until they were almost unconscious. So flogging was punishment enough, and then they were thrown into jail cells that probably were no picnic either. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in an inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. So this is interesting. It, apparently, Paul and Silas knew how to create good weather and carry it with them wherever they were, because they were in this dark, stinky, moldy cell, and to them, the sun was shining. One of these men later wrote, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. What were his circumstances? Maybe he had a bump or two along the way, but nothing really major, right? Well, in, Corinthian, in a letter to the Corinthians, he wrote, he, he gave them some of his circumstances. He said, 
I have worked much harder than my accusers, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in dangers from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And then he wrote this. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul apparently had a source of inner strength, kind of a spiritual core that allowed him to find the happiness of grace, no matter what his outside circumstances were. He chose his weather and he carried it around with him. He chose gratitude. Now my stepdad, Skip McCarty, he is the one who developed what he calls the gratitude zone. And I'd like to share it with you. Kind of the, um, the beginning of it is understanding how we should establish high goals but lower our, our expectations. So to define those terms, a goal is something worthwhile that you've committed to accomplish, a dream for which you've set a date to become a reality. In other words, setting goals for ourselves is part of the happiness of excellence, right? An expectation is the benefit that you hope to personally gain from your efforts. I couldn't resist this. This just popped up in my, my Facebook feed from a friend of mine in Michigan. I, I didn't ask her permission to use this, but I hope she'll forgive me. But it said, the key to happiness is low expectations. Lower, nope, even lower, there you go. So in other words, we want to set high goals for ourselves, but to set as low as realistic expectations as we possibly can. So Skip, my stepdad, he created what he called the gratitude zone. And what, what basically this is, is comparing two scales. On one side, we have a scale of goals, and on the other side, we have a scale of expectations. And they have different relationships to ter stress terms that I, I will define in a minute. So with goals, if we have too low a goals, we experience distress from it. If we set very high goals for ourselves, then we experience a positive kind of stress called eustress. With expectations, this relationship gets flipped. So if we have very high expectations, we probably are going to experience distress from that. If we have low expectations, anything that happens to us that exceeds those low expectations, we're going to feel happy about. And so we will experience the positive kind of stress or eustress. So Skip came up with this one example where maybe you take a class. And you set a really high goal for yourself in taking this class. So it's on the high end. It's in the you stress range, positive stress. It's going to probably teach you a lot of stuff that you didn't know before. And that in itself is going to be really cool. So you're pursuing the happiness of excellence. But you've also um, decided that you're going to have high expectations of what you're going to achieve as a result of taking this class. Maybe you think that as a result of taking the class, you're going to have a important job promotion at work. But when you take the class, you enjoy the class, and maybe even you enjoyed it more than you thought you did, but you actually didn't get a job promotion in, as a result. So the difference between your expectation and what you actually realized is called the stress zone or the distress zone. And we ourselves are responsible for creating it in having that difference between our high expectation and what we can real realistically take from experiences. On the other hand, maybe you have this situation where you take a class and you set that high goal for yourself so you have the happiness of excellence. You enjoyed the class even more than you thought you were going to and you didn't have any other expectation beyond that. So here, the difference between your low expectation 
And what actually happened, what you actually realized, is called the gratitude zone. So you've not only achieved happiness of excellence by taking the class, you've also achieved the happiness of grace because you're grateful for any benefit that you get from the class whatsoever. Barry Schwartz wrote, we can probably do more to affect the quality of our lives by controlling our expectations than we can by doing virtually anything else. And this is a cool quote by a person that many of us probably know, Ellen White. She wrote, nothing does more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. So that is the first five stress-reducing beliefs. I think this is a good time to take a break, and we'll continue with the last five. And I'll tell you a story at the end that kind of brings all ten of the stress-reducing beliefs together. So thank you for being here for the first session. Yeah. Sure. Four, what time is it now? It's uh, 3.57. Let's start at 4.10, I think. Well, do you guys need a longer break than that? I should ask. Yeah. Thank you. Which one are you talking about? 